In the name of Jesus, thy wish shall be our. Hello, brothers and sisters. Let the music play. In this harmonious mood, we are going to start reviewing some of my favorite books, books related to Christianity and books related to business. I am priest in business, I am priest in Christ. So let's begin with the first book, The King with Asher. My pastor before I went to seminary used to tell me if you cannot explain your theology to a six-year-old, then you really don't understand it. Of course, he was overstating a point and encouraging me to think hard about God and His word. So, as the best communicates some doctrine to others, yep. Though with an honest point, in his words, children can and should be taught theology. Sproul models this for the church in his wonderful series of children's books. Yes, this is the same. Sproul of the Holy Lord Ministries, the author of more than 60 books, and one of the men. God has used to influence an entire generation of pastors, teachers, as the elogious around the globe. I would also have fathers and brothers around the globe. Known for his clear communication of Reformed theology and engaging defense of Orthodox Christianity, Sproul has taken the time to communicate some of the wonderful deep truths of God to children. These four books were originally published in the order listed above. The King Without a Shadow was originally published in 1996, and The Priest in Dirty Clothes was originally published in 1997 with Thomas Nelson, but has been republished in 2011 to the Reformation Trust. This newer edition contains new illustrations and is added for the parent section. This now gives three of the four books, The King Without a Shadow being the exception. The look and feel of Unified Series. These three have the same illustrated Justin Harold along with helpful guides for parents. As the books are used as tools for the illustration and training of their children in a family context. The King Without a Shadow is an enjoyable story about God as the one true King over the earth and the only King without the shadow of sin. It is a story of a small boy during the times of knights and castles who asks his King the simple question, where the shadows come from? In seeking to find the answer to this question, the king is loved to discover the truth about his own sin, and God is the true king. Although the story is well written and certainly communicates a profound truth in an enjoyable way, it is lacking in a few, mostly minor, areas compared with the other three books. First, the story is rather long, with several portions being unnecessarily wordy. Younger children, especially, 
may find it more difficult to follow. Second, while the illustrations are of a high quality and quite enjoyable, they're a different style than the other three, make this book seem not to fit with the others. Third, the story lacks the setting of a grandfather teaching his grandchildren. The other three stories are introduced by a grandfather answering a question posed to him by a lot of his grandchildren. This simple feature gives the stories a pleasant family feel to them and helps one see how teaching a real theory to children can happen in every day of life. Fourth, this volume does not contain a full on the parents section and therefore lacks a helpful tool to assist parents in providing substantive instructions. Finally, of all the books, the story lacks the Christ figure entirely. And we believe in Christ. Christ is supposed to be the center of attention. Christ is the God who is there for us. This really seems to be out of place and is the biggest weakness with this story. The story does teach a profound truth about the nature and character of God and even illustrates man's sinfulness. Yet, with no Christ figure, in the story, there is no real answer for human sinfulness, nor an explanation of how sinful people can approach this king without a shadow. The priesthood dirty close is the next story in the series, and its sprawl teaches children the truth. Teaches children the truth. Of a time that is a person of favor to sprout. Six, three, one. This way. Important biblical doctrine of imputation is powerfully illustrated through the story of the priest that gives his very special garment dirty and cannot stand before the king until he is clean again. Children learn from this story that they can do nothing to rid themselves of the dirty clothes of their hearts, their sin, but Christ, the King's Son, can lay their dirty clothes upon himself and give us his clean clothes, his righteousness. The story is sad in the context of a grandfather telling his children a story. The house grown out of an everyday occurrence. It's poor that soil their clothes by making mud pies. The lightings was my first introduction to these books by R.C. Sproul. My wife and I purchased this book where all the store was six years old. Our son was four and our youngest was about two. We immediately fell in love with the clear communication of the message, the beautiful illustrations, and the great questions. He stirred and out God is heart and mind. We determined to get the other related books as we go frequently to our children. Our children are now nine, eight, and six, and they love, they love these stories. Moreover, we have noticed that the older they get, the more they are able to understand, the deeper they are able to think about the truths communicated. It was a joy to read each of the stories to them again in preparation for this to review and solicit their feedback. The lightings vividly illustrates the story of original sin and mankind's rebellion against God. 
Again, it is sad in the context of a grandfather answering an everyday kind of question for his grandson. In this story, God is pictured as the father of life who creates beings to imagine him and reflect his glory. This lightning rebel against him and find themselves living in darkness that no desire to see the light. Only because of his love and grace does the father of the light send his son as the light of the world and draw some light into himself. Children learn in this story that only through faith in Christ by God's grace are they able to live the life God created them to live. The life imagined him and for his glory. The Prince's Poison Cup is my personal favorite. Essential gospel truths are communicated so clearly that my own soul is refreshed every time I read them to my children. Once again, Sproul said this story in the context of a grandfather answering an everyday question from one of his granddaughters. This story powerfully depicts the reality of Christ taking upon himself the wrath of his father, absorbing the full punishment due to the sins of his people so they can be the recipients of God's mercy and grace. Here we have a king who sees his created people rebel and in disobedience drink of the very fountain, the only fountain from which he had forbade them to drink. As a result, the people's hearts grow hard and they flee from the garden of paradise to build their own city, the city of men. Our king, who knew his people were going to rebel in this way, had already planned with his son that the son would go to the sea of man and drink from the poisonous fountain of his father's wrath. The son would die, but as a result, the father promised to change the hearts of his people from stone to flesh and draw them to himself through his son. The king raises his son to life again and keeps his promise by giving the people faith to come and drink of his fountain of light. Each of the latter three books in this series have been illustrated by Justin. Gerald. Gerald is a talented and capable artist who has managed to appropriately illustrate the meaning of the story with beauty and clarity. The illustrations in these volumes serve to add a special clarifying force in communicating the message of each story with the inclusion of the four the parent section in each of the last three books they become more than stories to read to your children. They're fully developed teaching tools. Parents can read the questions and accompanying scripture passages to help them gain a better understanding of the doctrine thought. They can then ask their children the same questions or tailor the questions to their child's age, helping them to think more deeply regarding the truths found in these stories. Let us be thankful for the gifts God has given to his church, not least those who are gifted to help parents and other adults faithfully teach the wonderful truth of God's word, and especially the person and work of Christ to children who are adapted to Isis Raul for his careful communication that draws in children and adults alike. May we follow his example, teach children sound theory, and prison though with a compelling picture of the majesty of Christ in the gospel. A very interesting review by Joel Fleener. Fleener is from Howie Baptist Church in New Zealand. Let's move on and review all of a Christian response. 
This is a much shorter review. So let us begin purposes is this. The guy we need though. Born and raised in former Yugoslavia, Miroslav Volf currently serves as professor of theology at Yale Divinity School. His writings have earned him the reputation of a godly man. The reputation of being a leading expert on religion and conflict. As he won the 2002 Grammier Award in Religion, our Christian response to Jerusalem's how Christians view the God of the Quran. Training is a committed Christian, he aims to reach peace between Christians and Muslims. He also writes to Muslims calling on them to reflect on his proposal. The bulk of the book attempts to show that both Christians and Muslims worship the same God based on their belief that there is only one Creator God who is good and calls people to love Him and their neighbors. Acknowledging differences between the two religions that require them to remain different religions and not one religion, Wolf attempts to minimize these differences. What the Quran denies about the Trinity is what the Bible also denies. And it is possible for a person to be both a practicing Muslim and committed Christian. Wolf should be commended for championing peace and tolerance between Christians and Muslims and for calling on freedom of expression and healthy dialogue. He admirably calls on Christians and Muslims to work together for the common good of humanity. Wolf also highlights Christian and Muslim mistakes in history, referring to historical figures spanning the Christians, the Turkish invaders, and events surrounding the common word godly in 2007. Wolf acknowledges that the Crusaders had an all biblical warrant and he calls on Muslims to renounce all forms of violence. Wolf defends the doctrine of the Trinity against Muslim critics and the correctly connects the Trinity to the attribute of Allah. He boldly shows the contradiction in Islam claim to believe in the same God Christians do while believing that the doctrine of the Trinity compromises God's oneness. Wolf, Wolf also shows that the punishment for disobedience in the Quran is much more severe than in the Bible and that God's law is less obvious in the Quran than the Bible. He notes that Muslims as a whole insist on punishing conversion to another religion while modern Christians do not. The book has several serious weaknesses. First, while Christianity and Islam may have the same starting point of reference in the word of Allah, their descriptions of this Allah are much further apart than both claims. He accurately stresses that Allah is the Arabic word for God, used in the Arabic Christian Bibles today. Inaccurately stating it includes indefinite article. It could be added that Allah comes from the original Aramaic. It appears in the Aramaic portion of the OET. and is the very word Jesus would have used in referring to God. In other words, the word Allah did not originate with Islam. The point is that what is said about this Allah is what counts. For both, it is as though Christianity and Islam have the same subject but different predicates. But the predicates are so different that they predefine the subject so as to Question the premise of being the same God. Wolf fails to acknowledge that by Islam's claim to believe in the God of the Bible, will define, deny, excuse me, 
not only the train it, but all the theory behind it, they end up attacking the very God they claim to believe in. Second, Wolf seeks to reach peace at all costs, even if it means compromising or hiding the truth. It calls for striking deals, seeking charitable interpretations or others' views, and building of sufficient similarity. But he fails to show that settling for sufficient similarity deprives the other side of the unique queens deemed critical of the eternal destiny. The girls of world the two group worship the same god and not their views should prompt them to rise to the highest level of living, at peace with each other. In the end, however, Wolf's idea of elevating relationships over truth eventually leads to losing both. Third, the author recognizes that for moral attributes to be active in God apart from creation requires a relationship with God. In other words, God would need to become dependent on creation to exercise them. But Wolf finds this relationship expressed in God's self-love and Islam is adequately similar to the intertransmission relationship in Christianity. These are serious flaws here and now adequate relationship can exist in one the universal beam and the triune relationship. Tree and the relationship with Alus, love and good self love. In fact, the glory of the Trinity is in the more each person gives to the others. It's love and humility, not only overflow in creating, but also in Christ's death and the cross. Both finds the self love concept in the minor suffice sect of Islam that does not represent old Islam, ignoring the formal dominant historic Asharai position on the attributes of God, which emphasizes that all moral attributes stem from God's power, will not his nature, so that they are accidental and are essential to his nature. Herein God loves, not because he is love, but because he chooses to love and would choose not to. Similarly, God, being merciful and compassionate in Islam, describes only what he can do, not what he is. In Christianity, however, God's mercy and compassion are grounded in eternal relationships between persons in the perfect unity of God's being. Additionally, God's relationship to his people in the Bible is further described as that of a spouse, a lover, a father, a brother, and friend. Concepts foreign to Islam and thought to be offensive. Love and Christianity is initiated by God, not man. Finally, why would Islam close the door of God revealing truths about the mystery of his oneness in ways about Muslims' understanding? Wolf tries, Wolf tries very hard to trust Islam with Christian values. Where would he go? For example, in showing that Islam calls people to love God. The only supporting reference both sides is the Quranic assertion that there is no God but Allah. Similarly, he cites no Quranic verse calling for the river, but only in the Hadith, while ignoring so much in both the Quran and the Hadith calling for the exact opposite. Though Wolf's motive may be noble, it seems very forced. Wolf forces Christianity into the confines of Islamic theology, responding to the strong Quranic teaching that God's love is conditional. He tries to show that Christianity is the same, ignoring the notion that 
Obedience in the Bible is a result of regenerated and justified life. Chess absent in the Quran. Here Wolf confuses the root with the fruit of Christian life. He also constantly compares the behavior become better or worse the closer they come to the Bible or to the Quran. At one point, Wolf attempts to define normative versions of Islam and Christianity. Without consistently trying them to the Bible and the Quran. Time to the Bible and the Quran. Excuse me, brothers and sisters. The book records that just as Christians hold that Jews believe in the same God while denying the training in the art to say the same about Muslims. However, both fails to show that the OT understanding of God is the foundation for the end the revelation of the Trinity. This foundation includes elements about God that are absent in the Quran, including many references to God's desire to be known and trusted based on his unchanging attributes. The acceptance of the many anthropomorphic and anthropomorphic expressions of God, numerous references of God adversity in unity and the frequent theophanies. In other words, Wolf fails to see the Jewish monotheism differs drastically from Islamic monotheism and he glaringly ignores what the resurrection did to the early Jewish Christians or stabbed or seed in monotheism and without an overnight change you bring them to worship a human being. Why? They were impacted by the power of his person and the reality of his resurrection. His resurrection. coming to see that the fullness of deity dwells in him. Both also displays a serious misunderstanding of God's so he commands to obliterate entire nations. He is very different than the Quranic Jihad. The biblical conquest is marred by the following. It is limited to one time, not all times. It is limited to one lamp, not all lamps. It judges sin to fulfill prophecy, not to adhere to a religion. It shows God's holiness, though His power. His goal is to bless the whole earth, not subdue it. It is God fighting for His people, not the people fighting for God. It is according to God's trustworthy nature, not according to a capricious nature. If the figures God finally Absorbing it is our judgment and wrath of all nations in Christ of on the cross. Judgment deserved became judgment absurd. It's because the anti skin cheese with the old C does not mean that the Quran is continuous with the current C, as Wolf implies. This is a very dangerous thesis. The Muslim claim. To believe is like the portions of the Bible does not require Christians to do the same with the Quran. The main reason is that the Quran presents different versions of the stories of the Bible and gives an incomplete picture of Christ the salvation, meanwhile, contradicting many teachings and accounts of the Bible. The lack of freedom in Muslim countries today is also more serious than Wolf maintains. In the relatively rare conversion of a month into Christianity, while Christians is called upon for the new believer in Christ from a Muslim background, the NC calls on all Christians to grow to majority in Christ. 
was God is superior to all other tribulations and to all prophets and angels. Lord Christian from a Muslim background could retain their cultural identity, their new identity, is in Christ alone. This was reviewed by IMF Shadi, Jordan and McGill Thursday Seminary. This was a very, 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 very serious review full of great citizens. But let's move on and continue with our third video. The book called The Mission Church and Leadership Formation was reviewed by Gerald Haston. It's a relatively short review, so let's begin. Crack from Gerald's tentative volume, The Missional Church and Leadership for Major Results from the Third Annual Missional Church Consultation, hosted by Luther Seminary, and is the third book in Erdman's Missional Church series. In the words of Van Jared, this book seeks to bring further clarity to the world missional and to contribute to the ever widening missional church conversion by engaging the issue of leadership formation. Contributors are drawn primarily from leaders without the main blind tradition, including Richard Lees, Sharon, Hauserlum, Carolyn, Scott, Carmel, Dave, Gil Babe, Terry Mortison, Alton, Kyle, you a small Christian, Stahe, and Craig Von Gerald there. The first section examines the relationship between theological education and leadership formation with the saves from Von Gerald Snow and Bliss. The second section explores how missional leadership formation can both be cultivated within and through Congress congregations. Page 97. With the seas from Carmel, Cohan, and Delbert. The final section house chapters from Dalton and Stuckface seeking to answer the questions what does all of this actually look like with the real congregations? Page 173. Rather than offering a detailed response to each essay, the following paragraphs highlight the notable aspects of the book and mainline conversation. Let's talk about this part. This book is clearly situated in the mainline Protestant context. To orient newcomers, it will help readers to know what, in many ways, the mission, the missional church movement is to the main line tradition. What the emergent church movement is to evangelicalism only in regards. Where is the emergent church movement in pushing evangelicalism to work on affairs often championed by the mainline tradition? The missional church movement is pushing the mainline tradition to work on affairs more in line with historic evangelicalism. And now the fact is that the missional church movement and the emergent church movement tend to meet in the middle space between evangelicalism and the main wine tradition. Like leading voices in the emergent church movement, the missional church and leadership formation emphasizes social justice, Trinitarian theology, the importance of community and egalitarianism. Egalitarianism, relating both to gender issues and congressional poverty. Those critical of the emergent church will find similar ground of critique in this book, and those sympathetic to the con concerns of the emergent church will find much that resonates. However, the mutual church and leadership formation works. They is a franchise 
poem is told often found in the emergent church literature. Evangelicals are not the foil of this book, making it more palatable to traditional evangelical readers. Regarding theological education, what the subtitle of the book is helping congressions develop leadership capacity. The first section of the book addresses the topic of theological education in the seminaries. Since the inception of the seminary, theological education ministry training has often been characterized as not sufficiently connected to the local church. The mainline tradition has not escaped this basic as the various sections the states show. Van Gilder The property theory is the question about the key focus of the seminary. Does it exist for an academical formation, the search of professional training, page 36. The failure of a seminary to answer these questions down Jolder argues inevitably result in mission confusion for both professors and students. Small's chapter distinguishes between lots of thought, scholarship, and idea. Wisdom as categories for orienting the focus of a seminary. Healthfully arguing for the via near of critical idea. And please rightly criticize the encyclopedic approach to theological education that has gone through territory seminary training due to the influence of the German system. Pages 87 to 89. Well, I find myself sympathetic, sympathetic with the critiques developed by Van Gera, Small and Wies, and correspondingly sympathetic with some of their solutions. The essays do not in the old of her paradigm shifting way forward. To be sure, the summary must take a robust place in theological education. After nearly 300 years of trying to dial the seminary education, it is past time that knowledge that leadership formation cannot take place fully in a classroom. Context dark and theological scholars should be delegated entirely to the academy. The social vocation of the church and the academy are simply too far removed from each other. The pastoral community must once again become a significant theological voice in the church. In the local church, the primary means by which the future leaders of the church are trained. I would have liked to have seen an awareness of these reality more fully flirted in the proposals offered by them, jobbers, small and bees. How helpfully after. The most disappointing aspect of this book particularly as it relates to the last two sections is its inability to speak and read me. For instance, one contributor observes is Culture refers to the whole social practice of meaningful action and Christian theology has to do with the meaning dimension of Christian practices. The cultural dynamics of an active view of God and discipleship as a way of life as at their core this issue of the meaning making of Christian practices. Page 194. It sounds, of course, especially significant. But what it actually means in concrete terms is difficult to say. On the whole, the book conveys more theological self than natural plan. We must say more than relationships. How important the leadership formation and the congregation must be empowered by leadership. Etc. Everyone, of course, agrees 
that relationships are important and that the Gashas should be empowered, but what does this actually look like in real time? It's a focus on cremation theory, theology, and its corresponding emphasis on relationships mean that the congressionals should not swallow their roots as a spaceful mechanism for leadership formation, or that local churches should embrace a congregational quality over an episcopal stature. It's not clear. Even the final two chapters each attempt to provide a complete life on the real picture of leadership formation failed to offer practical ways forward. The essays in the missional church and leadership formation demonstrate theological sophistication and learning, but in the end the book offers very little to critique and really because it fails to make enough complete assertion. Reed is looking for a book of leadership formation that terminates in concrete proposals will likely be disappointed. This was a review by Gerald Houston, Gerald Houston from Calvary Memorial Church in Illinois. We have two more reviews, and one is my favorite. Let's talk about business. Why business matters to God. Because I do business myself, I am priest in business on God, I would love to specifically emphasize focus on this one. This is a review by Jeff Van Gother, why business matters to God and what still needs to be fixed. Most Christians spend most of their time working often in business, many feel their work is meaningless in God's eye. Work is meaningless in God's eyes. But Van Duther argues the opposite. Business is the essential sphere in the unfolding work of God in Christ. Van Duther crowns his theology in the creation mundane, God's call to people to till and keep the garden of freedom and to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1, 28. In fulfilling this Monday, business appears to be uniquely well situated to work the fields, to cause the land to be fruitful and to fill the earth what we mind the morning Parallels characterizes to create wealth. The fall has corrupted the world, including business. But business matters to God because the creation mandate is still in effect. Given such a noble mission, maximizing shareholder wealth seems as inadequate purpose for business. Could the creation mandate really boil down to as Milton Friedman put it, that the social responsibility of business is to create its profits. The social responsibility of business is to create its profits. New York, The New York Times Magazine, September 13, 1970. Van Duzer says, No, nothing. In this Genesis model supports the conclusion that business should be operated for the purpose of maximizing pro profits. Page 45. Instead, he derives two purposes for business from Genesis. Number one, to produce goods and services that enable the community to flourish. And number two, to provide opportunities for meaningful work that will allow employees to express their God-given creativity. Age 42. Profit is a necessary means to achieve these very purposes. In the fallen world, business fails its noble mission again and again. Then Duzer examines dumping in India, Sad shops in Nicaragua, fraud in Amazon, child labor in Chinese, hill factories, racism at Tuxapo, cigarette ads, teacher in Joe Campbell, 
and death, each falsely fueled tank design in the forward pinto. He argues that maximizing shareholder returns causes, or at least exacerbates, these failures. If Ford Pinto seems a clear cut case, Ford estimates that fixing the problem would cost about $140 million, while clean death and injury damages has cost only $50 million. Page 54. The duty to maximize shareholder return means Ford was ethically bound to leave the hazard and fix, which resulted in several hundred darn deaths. God wants more firm business. For at least from Christians in business, Christians in business should participate in the redemptive work of Christ in their business work. Although we cannot reproduce it here, the inducer makes skill use of the work of R. Paul Stevens, H. Richard Niebuhr, and Andrew Cabot to develop practical implications for business. In particular, business needs to be transformed from self enrichment to service, substantially and partnership with the rest of society. He concludes by demonstrating that his model would not destroy the viable business sector but actually strengthen it. Why business matters to God is a major development in the theology of work. Then, Duzer realistically applies the best theological materials to the actual practice of business. You could actually make business decisions based on these arguments. He works within the market system, but he assesses it not by its own ideologies, but by God's word. His writing is clear, his argument vigorous, and his conclusions specific. But how has he cracked the nut? I'm not convinced. On the other hand, I'm not sure the major paradigm shift he proposes is worth the effort. The practical difference between Friedman's model and the inducers is love than you might be dead. Friedman acknowledges that profit seekers Profit-seeking must be constrained by the laws and ethical norms of society. Then Duzer acknowledges that business needs to make a reasonable profit. The two diverge. They diverge only when a business would legally and ethically make a higher profit by not providing means good and services and not providing meaningful jobs. How often is that? On the other hand, if it turns out that Van Dusers and Friedman's outcomes frequently to diverge and Van Dusers really better, his argument is theoretical. He starts with principles from scripture and applies them to business practices as best he can, not any task given the change in economic conditions over the past 2000 years. Friedman's argument is um, empirical. Taken from Adam Smith. History shows that society is better off when each business seeks to maximize shareholder return. Paradoxical that may seem. When theory clashes with data, theory usually loses. Perhaps searching for only one or two purposes of business is um detail. Within society, there are competing interests such as generating tax revenue, mining jobs, producing needed goods and services, and protecting the environment. Within any business enterprise, there are competing interests such as shareholder wealth, innovation, meeting social needs, and growing market share in individuals. One. A variety of things from the business they work for, including a high salary, an interesting job, social prestige, or a chance to create products that serve society. Rather than defining one or two purposes of business, perhaps we should search for better ways to mediate 
a great variety of purposes. Two major mechanisms already exist for social mediation, markets, and governments. A business enterprise is a kind of market where many individuals exchange items of value, such as labor pay, dividends, intellectual property, and emotional engagement. Does God have anything to say about how markets should operate? A business enterprise is also a body holiday in which the lack of the appointed officials, boards, managers, team leaders, etc. are sub goals, resolve disputes, administer justice, and provide for a flourishing common future. Does God have anything to say about political govern governance and made competing in chase? Dan Dozer is a lawyer with business experience, the rise of clarity, theological rigor, and practical wisdom. Would he be willing to write a sequel, godly waste in marriage and the any purposes of the business enterprise? I'd buy quality. This was a powerful review by William Massinger from Theology of Work Project in Boston, Massachusetts. Finally, we're going to take a look at the last review. The Gospel of John, where love comes to town. The traditional commentary focuses all its energy, detailing and explaining the Bible by means of its original social cultural context. The life setting with which it is most concerned is the ancient one. Such an approach, unfortunately, might be viewed as highlighting the differences between the world of the Bible and the contemporary world that is between the scholar and the pastor. Keep adding to him. However, accumulating biblical literacy. A new model of commentary called the Present a series edited by Paul Lee Lazar attempts to breach this world by reconsidering the appropriate intersection between them. In the series, introduction to the first published volume, The Gospel of John, but what comes to John, Mather admits that both worlds need to be understood and addressed. But for the reason this series, the starting place is not the Bible's original context, but if contemporary context. Even those who do not come from Christian background or know that Christian messages are normally over with and engage in pop culture at page 11. Mesgar writes the aim of the reason this series is to provide spiritual nourishment is biblically, theologically, and orthodox. I'm sorry, theologically, orthodox, and culturally significant. The form each volume in the series will take in better and extend it to say each author writing about the biblical book under consideration in an in interactive, reflective, and culturally engaging manner. But other com commentaries are concerned to bring the pastor into the ancient cultural context of the Bible. The resident series wants to help the pastor understand the Bible within their contemporary cultural context. There is an increasingly urgent need for pastors who feel right at home, but in the biblical text to bring the text home to today's Christ followers by interacting with the text expositionally by placing it 
within the context of contemporary daily life and by viewing their personal stories in light of their original context and unfolding drama or fiction scripture. While all the commentaries speak a foreign language to the lay reader, the President series wants to bring the Bible into the lay reader's cultural view. For people who feel right and all within contemporary culture, but who are foreigners, white house scripture can have in the world of the Bible without depending on their own context. Page 12. The Resident series sees itself as a distinctive new genre or approach. Which was one finger in the ancient scriptures and out of in the daily newspapers, and another finger touching the heart, all the while pointing to Jesus Christ, page 13. In line of this sea finger of grouch, the Gospel of John deals of various by various by periscope by periscope, by not locating the exegesis. At the level of the verse, the theme or message of each passage becomes the focus, the locus of the interpretation. We be rarely are detailed, discussed, or historical insights given. The handship point for the reader becomes the way scripture resonates in us and in the world. For example, Mercury begins the interpretation of one, one. A team with this statement. Deep down in our souls, we all long for a sales of touch. Page 28, such a starting point in the message that is very delivers from the passage as a whole and confined to an original meaning and explore their point of connection that begins with our culture and in our hearts and the theme is interpreted by news of synonymous examples and handle and analogies taken from pop culture. For example, life for fans of touch is explicated through the movie Crash, which explicitly discusses the souls of touch. Another example is 2112, where Manzier's point of connection is Jesus does know how to have a good time, which he defies, which, for example, expresses small vision, the scene project, the marriage supper of the limb. The final example is T121, where he described Jesus as personal, the best mode, Marilyn Manson, and Johnny Cash are all mentioned in the first paragraph. If we could compare translation theory to commentary, the resonates series is a paraphrasic commentary. There are some obvious strengths of the Gospel of John and the entire resonate series. First, the commentary is known to allow the biblical text to speak within and through contemporary culture. That's very right to demand that our present context be part of our interpretive matrix. A contributing and voting member of a exegetic comedy. The focus allows a richly theological gospel like the Gospel of John to speak more directly into our personal lives and world growth. Second, the commentary helps make connections between pop culture and the message of scripture. It serves to give examples of how one moves from the text larger meaning to a culturally engaged application. There are however some questions that need to be earth price. What kind of responsibility does the commentary have in regard to the text? Since the commentary is mediated through pop culture, the actual exegesis is implicit and behind the scenes. The reader certainly how to make an action from an already developed message the minimal assistance is given to the actual reading of the text on its own terms. Second, what does it mean to be culturally relevant? While well, the use of analogies and categories from pop culture might 
resonates with the reader, it is difficult to safeguard against. Either imposing a foreign category upon scripture, or just even if slightly the biblical categories themselves. This is not to deny the benefit first turn the resonates here is bring to the analysis of scripture, especially with a eye to the contemporary context. It is simply to ask what kind of help is provided for the pastor and the church. This is a review by Adelaide Quink from the Blood School of Theology in Bio University. This is all brothers and sisters. I was happy to read you books related to Jesus Christ, culture, and most importantly business, because this YouTube channel is all about business in Christ. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters. But staying here with me, I am dying me now. Is about the go. In the name of Jesus, thy we shall be alone.